wrap it up and put a bow on it. The regular season is done. Rivalry week has come and gone. But hey, there is still a lot of football in front of us. You are listening to the SEC Recap Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Warren. This is our SEC Rivalry Week Recap. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Regular season is at an end, but the year is far from over. We still have conference championships to look forward to, as well as the final playoff rankings. Then, of course, we have bowl season, playoffs that take us into January. So we've come a long way since September, but there is still a lot, a lot, a lot of football in front of us. Hey, while you're listening, follow us on Twitter at SEC Recap. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Sub to the channel. YouTube has been very good uh, for growth lately, so thank you guys so much for that. Um, And as always, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you prefer to chug your podcasts, we're there. There is plenty of time over the next few months to recap and revisit major headlines from the season. We've seen coaches fired, hired, had drama on and off the field. It's been a wild season, as we've come to expect from college football. There's no way it can be recapped in a single episode. So for this one, I think I'd just like to look back on some of the bigger headlines from Rivalry Week in the SEC, go through how it all shakes out for the SEC standings, bowl eligibility, playoff hopes, And then we'll end by going through my final SEC rankings, and I look forward to some of you guys sliding into the comments to, of course, tell me why I'm wrong. So some of the big takeaways from this Thanksgiving rivalry week. First of all, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. One of the best weekends of sports I can remember Super crazy, super eventful, starting with this game, the Egg Bowl. Mississippi State defeating Ole Miss 24-22 in the Egg Bowl. And then we had Ole Miss fans throwing trash on the field. In the words of Michael Scott, well, 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 how the turntables have... Of course, there was radio silence. From last year's Pearl Clutchers, Peter Burns, David Ubbin, all those guys. All those guys who excoriated the entirety of the Tennessee fan base and the Tennessee program for the fans that were throwing trash on the field after some questionable refereeing there in the the Ole Miss game last October. Radio silence. Radio silence as Ole Miss fans were throwing chairs onto the field. Throwing other things onto the field. Come on, guys. What's up? It's awful when Tennessee does it. But when anybody else does it, it doesn't even get a mention. Careful, y'all. Your bias is showing. Credit to Mississippi State in this game. Their defense. It was really kind of a lazy game in the first half. Uh, You know, stayed pretty tight. Mississippi State did a great job defensively there in the second half. Um, credit credit to that side of the ball and that defensive staff to take it to Ole Miss. Uh, Lane with his own set of drama. Now we're learning staying at Ole Miss while Auburn is looking at bringing in Hugh Freeze. Lane Kiffin shouting out, uh, what's that guy's name? John Sokoloff, who had been reporting multiple times that Lane Kiffin to Auburn was a sure thing. It was a sure thing. It was basically a done deal. All of his sources said it's done. Lane Kiffin is gone. Lane Kiffin coming out after the game and saying, when this guy publishes this, everybody takes it as gospel. Then he has to sit his players down before the game and say, hey guys, look, none of this is true. I'm staying here. It turns out Auburn has taken a good long look at Hugh Freeze who, by the way, has not had a great end to his season. In the Iron Bowl, I think we all knew this was happening or would happen. Look, playing inspired football is just not enough for Auburn and Cadillac Williams to overcome the obvious talent and coaching gap between Auburn 
and Alabama. I mean, those guys have played really hard last three, four games of the year. But like I said in my in my Iron Bowl preview, it, it ain't a movie. You can't just show up at the end of the season, make an inspirational speech, and, you're, and your underdogs go out there and win the game. Talent matters. Coaching matters. I think Cadillac Williams has done a great job as the interim. A lot of people really high on retaining Williams as the head coach at Auburn, particularly if they could upset Alabama. I think we can put that to rest for good now. I mean, I think he'll still be on that staff. Honestly, whoever takes that job, Hugh Freeze or otherwise, should absolutely make sure that Cadillac Williams is on that staff. They'd be a fool not to. He does a lot of good things for that program. But I think all of that hype about Cadillac Williams getting a serious look for that job, um, that was just a media narrative. You got to watch out for those. Guys love it. Love putting feel-good stories out there. There's not a lot of substance behind that, unfortunately. One of my faves, Texas A&M wrecking LSU's college football playoff hopes in a 15-point win that really felt like a blowout. I mean, LSU never led in this game. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I would have said that Texas A&M would still love nothing more than playing the spoiler. I still think LSU should have won that game easily. They never had a lead in that game. They let Devon A-Chain go for 215 yards and two TDs. Man, it's hard to have a good day when you're just giving up the field like that. It'll be interesting to see what the college football playoff ranking shakeup will be now with Ohio State, LSU, and Clemson losing. Very unlikely a second SEC team gets in. I mean, that was the case last week, right, when Tennessee lost uh, at South Carolina. As LSU already being a two-loss team, plus having to play Georgia in the SEC championship game, that made that probability of a second SEC team sliding in there very low. Speaking of Tennessee, Vols, I think, definitively put to bed any doubt about the culture, quote-unquote, in their locker room with a 56 to nothing thump of the Vanderbilt Commodores. That defense that just gave up everything. Again, you know, real fluky. I mean, you can say that Tennessee's pass defense has been bad all season, and, and that's a fair assessment. But what we saw last week against South Carolina, in my opinion, complete fluke that was something different that was just rolling over and laying down well that defense did not do that this week they allowed just 254 total yards zero points to a vandy team that was coming off two huge sec wins for that program winning at kentucky and the winning at home versus florida and they were really hungry to get bowl eligible under clark lee you had Kirk Herbstreet and some other Tennessee haters looking at you, Jordan Rogers, Vandy alum, coincidentally, making completely unsubstantiated comments about Tennessee's locker room and team culture throughout the week. Basically thing that Vandy was just going to whip Tennessee. You know, Kirk Herbstreet said, you know, to Tennessee, you know, staying in the top 10 or whatever in the playoff rankings, he said, well, you're not going to have to worry about that when Vandy beats Tennessee next week. I mean, they wrote Tennessee off after that South Carolina loss. Whether it was right or wrong, complete overreaction. Here was Josh Heupel after the game. He said, A lot's been made about the culture in our locker room, whatever it might be. Like, this is a culture win, man. That was Josh Heupel taking a direct jab at the Herb Streets of the injury. A quick rundown of the scores from the week, starting with the Thursday game, working through the Saturday games, the Egg Bowl. Again, Mississippi State 24-22 over Ole Miss. Florida losing on the road at Florida State in a pretty tight one. Uh, Florida State 45, Florida 38. Not the end to the season that Gators fans were hoping for under Billy Napier. I think you still got to be patient. I think you got to give it time. Do not jump on the fire him now bandwagon. I'm telling you, you're going down a slippery slope uh, if you just 
if you keep having that turnover year after year after year, you got to give the guy time, let him get his players, let him get his assistant coaches, let him get his system. I know it's not what you wanted, but I think there's still upside here over the next two to three years in Gainesville. The battle line rivalry on Black Friday. It's hard to even call it a rivalry. Mizzou's kind of owned Arkansas, weirdly enough. Mizzou 29, Arkansas 27. Mizzou takes home that big hunk of scrap metal. Rough end to the season for Arkansas. I think Sam Pittman, I know he already fired the strength and conditioning coach. I think he's got to take a good, long, hard look at that staff. There's definitely some good things that happened, but they just had a ton, a ton, a ton of defensive injuries. Sure, some of that stuff, you know, is just going to happen. It's the game of football. It's a physical sport. Grown men are pounding each other into the dirt. But when you have that many injuries that sort of doesn't do you any favors, derails your season, I think you do have to take a long look, and I don't think it's going to stop with the strength and conditioning coach. Next up, Georgia at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech playing a good, tight defensive football game, but in the end, they just didn't have the dudes, couldn't score points to keep up. Georgia wins that one 37 14. Um, you know, it's hard to, to really nitpick Georgia, but I'm going to do it. That first half was not solid and they got to do a better job of punching in punching that ball in in the red zone we saw that when they played Mizzou and had that real ugly slow game where Mizzou was able just to frustrate them enough hold them to field goals Michigan's a good team um I don't know that anybody else in that top four is really gonna pose a threat but uh you know there's kind of a blueprint forming now. You look at what Mizzou did. You look at what Georgia Tech did to frustrate them and hold them out of the end zone. Uh, Georgia just has to be better there punching the ball in. Then we had South Carolina at Clemson. South Carolina on a hot streak. They just take off Clemson 31-30. to I have a lot of different thoughts. Can't get into them all on this game. You know, Clemson had a lead basically the entire game, maybe until the fourth quarter. I don't have the box score in front of me. I mean, they were leading by nine points at different instances throughout this ball game. Spencer Rattler had two picks. Kind of looks like the same, same Spencer Rattler we've seen, you know, through the first 10 games of the year. And then they just managed to, to hold Clemson and get the ball in, you know, Kind of edge him out there. DJ Uyangalale, I mean, was not good. That guy needs to get out of Clemson. I don't work for national media. I work for this podcast for myself. So I don't have to watch what I say here. Uh, that Clemson offensive staff, atrocious. Their running back's pretty good. But that Uyangalale was one of the best prospects coming in as a freshman. And that staff has not done him any favors. Get out of there, dude. Get out of there, young man. If you happen to hear this, go somewhere where your skill set can be utilized. It is going to die there in Clemson, South Carolina. Next up, up in the state of Kentucky, Louisville going on the road to Lexington. I picked the Cats to win this one. 26, Louisville 13. Really nice job. Kentucky kind of owns Louisville as of late. Louisville a ranked team. Uh, pretty good win. You always want to win those in-state rivalries. Not a lot to take away. Kentucky, again, not the ending they wanted to their season. We'll we'll get into all of that when we talk through the rankings. Uh, but a solid way to end the year on a positive note there for them. I think Mark Stoops is also going to take a long look at that coaching staff. As I mentioned in the Iron Bowl, Alabama comes out on top 49, Auburn 27. I think the most noteworthy thing coming out of this game was that weird muff punt call. You go watch that, the camera view that shows him from the front. That ball didn't even touch the Auburn kick returner's hands. Um, really, really bad call. Auburn never had a shot to win this game. I mean, let's be honest. They did. They were really good in the first quarter, 
but Alabama started to pull away there. You knew Auburn wasn't going to be able to keep it close. That one call didn't change the calculus of the game in any way, shape, or form. I mean, you still lost by uh, three scores, but that's still a disappointing call when you have instant replay and you can take that much time to review. I mean, it was so obvious. Even Alabama fans knew that that was a bad call. Like I said, didn't matter. Didn't really cost him the game. Alabama was just the better team. But, man, if I'm the SEC or anybody in charge of, of looking at these officiating crews, you got to sit these guys down and say, you cannot miss that because that kind of atrocious review is going to cost somebody an important game in the future. One of the biggest upsets of the day LSU getting knocked off in College Station by the Aggies. Aggies not even bowl eligible with this win, but they still take down LSU 38 to 23. LSU never had the lead in this game. Their defense was just giving up the field to the Aggies. It looks like they're finally starting to put it together offensively just in time for their season to end. Congratulations, Texas A&M. And then finally, Tennessee at Vanderbilt, 56-0. Most noteworthy here is Tennessee only had the ball for like 16 and a half minutes. 16 and a half minutes. They ran for over 300 yards. Vandy rolled over in the second half. It was a wet game. It was basically a monsoon out there. It was coming down from kickoff till the time the clock hit triple zeros. Tennessee was up, you know, going into the second half, like 21 to nothing. When they hit that first long, uh, it might have been that uh, that long touchdown run by Jabari Small. Vanderbilt's defense just looked like they did not want any more of that. They just wanted to get off that field. And honestly, I don't blame them. So here are the rankings. These are the AP Top 25. I'm recording this before the college football play playoff rankings have come out. Uh, so here's how the AP has shaken up. Georgia, of course, stays at number one. Michigan moves into that two spot because they beat Ohio State, really blew out Ohio State. TCU moves up to three. USC moves up to four. And Ohio State drops to the five spot. Then, number six and seven, you have Alabama and Tennessee. Okay, I'm going to rant here for just a second. I understand there are, and everybody's got differing views on this. It's all over Twitter. This is my view. Tennessee beat Alabama. It's the end of the season. There are no more regular season games left. Alabama and Tennessee are not going to play each other again okay so head to head has to matter these aren't power rankings where you're saying well you know if they met on a neutral field Alabama would be a you know whatever point favorite maybe a touchdown favorite because Hendon Hooker's hurt and now Tennessee has you know a, a backup quarterback that doesn't matter they're not playing again neutral field doesn't matter at the end of the season your record your resume and your head-to-head -head matchup has to matter why is tennessee behind alabama at seven when they beat alabama head to head i understand that these are a composite ranking of all the ap voters but to the ap voters <laughs> Ranking Alabama ahead of Tennessee, whom they lost to, you're basically saying that Alabama losing to Tennessee is somehow better than Tennessee beating Alabama. It makes no sense. Stop it. Stop this nonsense. Okay? Enough. Tennessee should be ranked ahead of Alabama. That's not my bias. That's based on the statistics and the fact that they won. If, if you beat Alabama and you can never get ranked ahead of Alabama, what's the point of playing Alabama? Voters and committee members are just going to be like, oh, well, Alabama is a better team anyway. It doesn't matter. We've got to cut that out. Cut that out. Uh, rounding out the top 10 there. That was my rant. Jumping off of my soapbox now. You have Penn State at 8. 
Washington at 9 and Clemson falling to 10, even though they lost to South Carolina. That is kind of what I figured. Um, I didn't think Clemson would slide out of the top 10. Meanwhile, LSU losing to non-ball eligible Texas A&M drops just out of the top 10 to the 11 spot. South Carolina jumps in to the rankings for the second time this year at the 20 spot. And Mississippi State uh, closes in at number 25. Okay, so let's go through my final SEC rankings. Every week, I've updated my power rankings, which is based on you know how each SEC team has performed through the season so far, while also factoring in head-to-head. Now that the regular season is done, that head-to-head is going to factor more heavily into these final rankings because these teams aren't going to face each other anymore outside of LSU and Georgia. So these are not reflections of how each team ranks in the AP Top 25 or the playoff rankings. These are the results from all these teams having played uh, throughout the season and then where there are ties in conference record and overall record, I default to uh, points for um, optimizing for points scored against SEC opponents. So I still have these divided into the three tiers, the first tier being elite, the second tier being, uh, you know, all those teams jockeying for middle position, and then uh, six teams at the bottom in my third tier. So I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. Um, The bottom three teams, this isn't every team in the bottom tier, but my bottom three, 14, 13, and 12, I have Vanderbilt, Texas A&M, and Auburn. All three of these teams went two and six in conference and five and seven overall. They are not bowl eligible. And I have Vanderbilt in last place because they they had fewer points scored than Texas A&M. And of course, I have Auburn ranked ahead of Texas A&M because Auburn beat Texas A&M head to head. So Vanderbilt finishes two and six, five and seven. Their best wins Uh, Kentucky and Florida, really great wins. Vanderbilt, Clark Lee outperforming expectations. They couldn't get bowl eligible. When you play in the SEC, it's just tough to do. Uh, But of course, Vanderbilt kind of has a handicap versus other SEC programs with those academic requirements. But overall, outperformed expectations, really, really solid way to end the season Uh, for Clark Lee and that Vanderbilt squad getting five wins. At 13, Texas A&M, two and six in conference, five and seven overall. They had more points scored in conference than Vanderbilt. Their best win is going to be this LSU win from Rivalry Weekend. And at 12, Auburn, two and six in conference, five and seven overall. They beat Texas A&M. I don't know what you would say Auburn's best win is. It would have to be maybe either Missouri or Texas A&M. I might say Missouri since Missouri ended up in slightly better position than Texas A&M. I think some things will get straightened out for Auburn next season with the right coaching hire. Rounding out our third tier at 11, 10, and 9, I have Arkansas, Missouri, and Florida. Starting with Arkansas at 11, they went three and five in conference, six and six overall. Their best win was the win over Ole Miss. They really didn't handle some of the games they were supposed to. They handled some of them, not all of them. At 10, Missouri, also three and five in conference, six and six overall. They're going bowling. They defeated Arkansas in the battle line rivalry, so I have them ranked ahead of Arkansas. Their best win at this point is definitely South Carolina. Uh, Any win that a team has had over South Carolina definitely looks a lot better now after the last two weeks of the season. And then at number nine, Florida, three and five overall, six and six in conference as well. Defeated Missouri at home, so they have the head-to-head advantage over Missouri there. And their best win is also going to be South Carolina. So there rounds out the third tier. Moving on up into my second tier, four teams here. Starting at number eight, Kentucky. They went three and five in conference, but they ended with a seven and five overall record. They defeated Florida in the Swamp. 
back at the beginning of the season, and they also had the second lowest points allowed in conference. So that defense was still really solid for the most part in conference play. They had that one fluky loss to South Carolina at home without Will Levis, and I still believe that had Will Levis played in that game, the way Kentucky's defense was playing at the time, and just how bad South Carolina was offensively and defensively, uh, at that point in the season, Kentucky would have won that game handily, uh, but they didn't, so I'm not giving them credit for it. I still like to use it as, as a factor, though, when I'm considering my placement in these overall rankings. They did lose to Vanderbilt at home. That was bad. You can't have that, and that's not where you want to be in like year 10 of Mark Stoops, losing to Vanderbilt at home. Uh, their best win is probably Mississippi State, so... Kentucky does not have a big signature win again. You're like, you have a, a coach that's been there for a decade. You've had a ton of time to install this system. This fan base is expecting you to get, you know, nine, 10 wins a season and you don't have a signature win. You need to stop scheduling those cupcake Mac teams and play some quality opponents. My two cents. Then, coming in at number seven, this is a lot higher than I've had them in my power rankings through the year, but this is where they deserve to be. At number seven, South Carolina. The reason they're still here in the middle of the pack is because they did finish four and four in conference, okay? On a hot streak in the year, but two good games at the end of the year doesn't make up for the kind of mediocre, average, subpar performance up to that point. So, four and four in conference. There are probably some games that you'd like to have back there. Eight and four overall. They defeated Kentucky. Their best win, no doubt, is probably the win over Tennessee. I know a lot of them are going to love that that Clemson win as well. But as far as the SEC goes, Tennessee is their best conference win. But they had losses to Arkansas, Missouri, and Florida. And those are all three teams in the bottom tier of the SEC. Those are all three teams that just barely got bowl eligible so if you're South Carolina you're happy the way this season ended but you just want to see more consistency throughout the year if you could have had this version of the South Carolina offense or just this version of South Carolina in general maybe at Arkansas that's a huge momentum boost carrying you through the rest of the season all right at number six Ole Miss also four and four in conference eight and four on the year. I have them ahead of South Carolina because they had more points for. Uh, so that's where the tiebreaker falls. They went seven and zero oh to start the season and then ended one and four. Not great. Their best win is probably Kentucky, which even at this point, that's not a signature win. I mean, that's not even a ranked win. They lost a close one to Alabama, sure, but then they got boat raced by Arkansas. So I don't really know what you do with Ole Miss. You know, a lot of people talked about them like they were elite to begin the year, but when you go one and four against some of your best competition to end the season, that is not elite status. Above them, rounding out the second tier, Mississippi State. Really more of a roller coaster team. They've been up and down. They do end the season four and four in conference, eight and four overall. Their best win is definitely Ole Miss, not just because it was a ranked win, but that was the Egg Bowl. That's the big one. That's the one they all want to win. Um, so still a good win for Mississippi State, but they lost to Kentucky, uh, and they don't have really a big signature win like Ole Miss. All right, moving on up into the first tier. Not a lot of shakeup here. At number four, Alabama. Okay. Yeah, they have the, they're tied for the second best record in the SEC, but the teams in front of them, they lost to. So that's why they're at the four position. They went six and two in conference, 10 and two overall. And it's so funny. 10 and two is a dream season for most teams in the country. But for Alabama, it's a rebuilding year, right? Uh, perspective matters a lot here. They had losses to LSU and Tennessee, 
But their best win is probably Ole Miss or Mississippi State, which are both in the tier below them. They don't have a signature win. All they have are two best losses. And that's where a lot of people want to point to uh, in these playoff rankings and the AP rankings. They say, well, Alabama should be on the bubble like that six spot. Some people even want to put them at the five spot, kind of right on the outside looking in at the playoffs because they lost by a combined four points on, you know, last minute slash overtime plays to Tennessee and LSU. But they don't have a signature win. All they have are two best losses. And it goes back to my my soapbox rant. You can't say that Alabama barely losing to LSU and Tennessee is somehow better than Tennessee beating Alabama and LSU. It just doesn't make sense. Again, head-to-head has to matter. If it doesn't matter, then why do we play the game? At the three spot, LSU they went six and two in conference. Remember, while they went nine and three overall, one of their losses was to a non-conference opponent, FSU, in week one. They are SEC West champions. They defeated Alabama head to head. That's why they're still in the number three spot. Okay, uh, because they have the same conference record with the head to head victory. Now they they did lose to Texas A and M. So I understand. Uh, if people want to knock LSU for that. But these are final rankings. LSU and Alabama aren't playing again. So I'm factoring in the head-to-head here. Alabama is their best win despite that the, the blowout at Texas A&M. I'm still keeping LSU in the three spot. I think Brian Kelly way outperforming expectations after that lost to Florida State in week one. At number two, no surprise here, Tennessee. They are six and two in conference. They went 10 and two overall. Best season the Vols have had since 2001. They defeated Alabama and LSU head to head. That's why they're here at the two spot. They did lose in fluky fashion to South Carolina. Still wish I knew what was up, but I'm not going to give credence to any of the rumors that were out there. Their best wins are against two teams in this top tier, though. So that's why Vols are my number two team overall in the SEC, which leaves no doubt at the number one, the Georgia Bulldogs went 8-0 and in conference, 12-0 and in the regular season for the second straight year, an unbelievable feat in its own right. They are the SEC East champions, undefeated. Their best win is definitely Tennessee. So if you're Tennessee, you got to be feeling good. You're Georgia's best win. You're South Carolina's best win. And you're probably Alabama's best loss, right? So if you're if you're Tennessee, even though you're in the number two spot, a lot of teams are claiming you as their best performance of the season. Uh, so there it is. Those are my final rankings. Look, a lot of football in front of us, right? We got SEC championship game. We have conference championship games. We've got bowl season. We've got uh, the playoffs that are going to take us into January. And all eyes are about to be on the transfer portal as we move into December. So stay tuned. There will be a lot of of news coming out it is going to be transfer portal madness guys thank you so much for listening don't forget check us out on twitter at sec recap you can get all of our content at sec recap.com if you're listening on youtube please smash that like smash that thumbs up sub to the channel i'm trying to grow on youtube Uh, That's where my focus is right now. But if you're listening in podcast form, go to Spotify, go to Apple, leave us a rating and review. It helps me grow the show. I appreciate all of your listens and views so much. Check out our merch on bonfire.com slash store slash SEC recap. We've got great SEC pride merch. I'll be back with you this week to preview the SEC championship game, LSU, Georgia in Atlanta. I'll also be previewing all of the SEC ball games. So a lot more content to come this December. 
Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great week. I'll catch you on the next episode of the SEC Recap.